Hi, everyone. Great to see you here. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this panel with uh, some of the most cutting edge people in the capital markets that are actually solving the real problems of getting the blockchain industry and smart contracts and Oracle networks actually used by the capital markets. These are some of the folks that we've been talking to and work with, and they are on the, on the very cutting edge. Here we have uh, Thomas, who is the tokenized assets product lead at Swift. We have Olivier, who is the leading DLT business analyst at Euroclear, the largest CSD in Europe. We also have Alex, who's the head of digital, secur um, the digital securities at SDX, which is uh, the official exchange of Switzerland. And Anurag, who is the product lead for digital asset services at ANZ, a trillion dollar asset under management leading global bank. So I'm very excited to jump into their, their views. Um, the first question that I'll, I have with all of you, just kind of going from uh, le left to right, is what do each of you think about the need for interoperability across multiple bank chains? Do you think there will be multiple bank chains that need to be connected? Thomas, uh, please go ahead. First, uh, thank you for having me. Um, let me be a little bit swift and trick to answer the question and step back on what Swift has been doing for years. We are interoperating bank applications, which are technology diverse. Um, and to do that, we rely on two main components. We rely on a communication channel that has to be trusted, that has to be understood. And we rely on standards, which is a way to make sure we understand each other and we know what is the purpose of the communication. When I look at the DLT adoption these days, I see plenty of DLT instances being created by banks. Uh, we are stepping out of an exploration phase. We're moving into a productization phase. This is a very complex landscape to interoperate. So I think we will need the exact same thing. We will need a communication channel that is trusted by all the institutions, and we will need standards to make those applications talk to each other. I would add one more thing is there is also the journey aspect. The DLT adoption will take time. It will start where it makes sense, where the business case is, which means we are not going to transform fully the bank operations at once, we will need also to interoperate existing standards with new standards. So definitely, I think we need to have an interoperability solution. We need a trusted channel to do that, and we need good standards. Great. Thank you. Olivier, what, what do you think? Will there be multiple new bank chains that need to be connected? Um, yes, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, from a central in market infrastructure, we really see a lot of different asset classes means mm -hmm. type of instrument. We don't believe each asset class is we have uh, a common blockchain all across the asset classes. So we will have to manage one minimum chain per asset class. As a central infrastructure like us, we will have to make these asset classes interoperable, of course. Uh, uh, the, the very simple thing is, uh, do I have a payment to match with my security? Yes, okay. At least you have two. <laughs> Uh, chain to, to connect. So this is extremely important. Another way that makes uh, multi-blockchain uh, or multi-DLT uh, system is probably the regulation. In Europe, we have a lot of regulation. And for example, I cannot have a shared platform with someone who is not a European, for example. So we will have to keep anyway these uh, different blockchains or different uh, private chains uh, and connect between them. Got it. Makes, makes perfect sense to me. Alex, uh, please go ahead. What, what are your views? Uh, so interoperability has been, uh, I guess, the key word for the financial industry since its inception. Uh, I mean, SWIFT is an example of infrastructure that has been created to create interoperability between banks, as mentioned by, by Thomas, and, and that, that, that will continue. The, we are uh, now implementing um, blockchain uh, solutions on different infrastructures because of the variety of blockchain existing out there, but also because of a specific use case, as you mentioned. And it's inevitable that in the future we will live in a world of multiple private and public blockchains having to somewhat interoperate to ensure that uh, assets can flow from uh, one issuer to a client, uh, one, in one investor to another investor. Uh, at the end of the day, we're working for the benefits of those two entities, the issuer and the investor and customers. And our role as an FMI, for example, is to ensure that it's smooth and uh, work in the best way as possible. As an FMI, um, financial market infrastructure, what we do in our everyday uh, work is 
connecting the market players in our countries, uh, for example, in the case of uh, six digital exchange in Switzerland, but also Spain. Uh, we want to play that multi-party role, uh, which is quite important in even on a blockchain infrastructure. A lot of people have said uh, infrastructures will disappear because of blockchain. Well, likely not, because you always need to have that regulatory interoperable model in place to ensure that multi-party can work together on the same smart contract. And that requires uh, interoperability of not only blockchains, but also rule books, market practices, and, and, and standards that everybody can understand. The same way that we're speaking lang English here on the, on the panel, although it's not our mother tongue, as we were mentioning during the, the lunch earlier, uh, we need common standards and we need in, um, the, a way to communicate successfully together. Yeah. Um, I, will, I will try to take a lens, which hopefully everyone in the room from the Web3 industry can also relate to. If you think about the promise of digital assets, it's all about efficiency and improvement. If we ended up taking any asset class and create a market, say, at 10,000 different places, the real problem is the fragmentation. And many of you would have swapped a token using an AMM or would have done trades. You know, the moment liquidity gets fragmented, the capital efficiency deteriorates significantly. So if the promise is efficiency, can we go towards a model which delivers an inferior result? So interoperability is really important to deliver that promised efficiency which we have been waiting for. Other mental model I think which we have to apply is, today's Web2 has been operating in an edge-based model where this edge-based model, information is flowing separately and value flows separately. When you hear about terms like T plus two, what it says is a transaction has happened just now, but the exchange and settlement happens after two days. The moment we move to a network model and an interconnected network model, that problem goes away. The amount of capital which will release when you go away from T plus two to T plus zero is insane. At ANZ, we believe the world is gonna be multi-chain for the obvious reasons. You don't need the same economic security for a $50 asset versus a $50 million bond. So do you need all the 800 or 700 validators of Ethereum to validate a transaction of $50? Maybe not. Maybe an app chain with three or four validators is fine. Whereas when we're talking about hundreds of billion, maybe we need that high value, high economic security chain, and then making sure that they are interoperable because if these assets don't transact, imagine you as users to be present on so many chains and take care of them. So that's the lens which I will apply to the need and the importance of interoperability. Great, thank you. I think those are all really, uh, really great points. Totally agree that we, we need standards. There's going to be a ton of different chains that, uh, that appear for every asset class. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, financial market infrastructures uh, do have a role to play in coordinating all the complexity around these chains using these new standards. Um, something like CCIP together with Swift messages sounds pretty good to me, <laughs> which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then also, from, from your point of view, I've, uh, Anurag, I, I think your, your points are very well put, is that fundamentally it's, uh, it's a problem of liquidity. So if there isn't sufficient liquidity, then you know, the asset you put on your chain doesn't have as much value. But if there is liquidity, then the asset suddenly has a big global market that wants to buy it, and that actually creates a virtuous cycle where more assets create a bigger and better market, which leads to more liquidity. So I think it's... Um, virtuous cycle that we're all working to get, to get underway. But, but moving on to some of the work that, that we've all uh, been able to do together on the POC with, uh, together with SWIFT, um, I think we showed that existing bank systems are able to connect to blockchains with the help of CCIP. What were your biggest takeaways uh, from our blockchain interoperability collaboration? So, um, do you hear me? Yeah. So, um, let me first say that I'm very pleased by the results of the experimentation. Um, we, combining the SWIFT network with CCIP, demonstrated that you can allow a bank to reuse an existing infrastructure 
to move assets seamlessly within a chain or across chains, which is, I think, a major building block that should be picked up by the industry to build business cases and use cases on top of it. Uh, that was an experiment, so it's only the beginning. We have open questions to address. Uh, the roles, the liabilities, uh, the use cases should be fleshed out. But definitely, from a SWIFT point of view, it made a very strong point, back to, back to what I was saying before. Uh, a secure communication channel and standards are key, in my view, and we demonstrated that we can extend the SWIFT network through an abstraction layer to act directly on chains, which is a very powerful uh, tool, I believe. Now it has to be picked up by the market, and it has to be um, understood and, and well used. No, it, it was an amazing experience, uh, I have to say. Uh, what we're talking about on-chain, but we have to keep in mind that the bulk of the business is off-chain. Off-chain means for banks uh, on a very old system, or old legacy system, old for you guys, new for us. Um, and, and the real benefit we will see uh, in the adoption of the DLT or the blockchain in, in a heterogeneous system like the banking one is by going step by step and making the first interoperability with the legacy. And using a swift message is very well seen as legacy in a way, huh? no offense. <laughs> but uh, what is very important is to go step by step and linking the legacy and of of boarding from the legacy, the system that you put on um, on a blockchain. So the experiment was very good for that. And at Euroclear, we have adopted the same uh, strategy, more or less, uh, because our first uh, system on a DLT was only for a very limited scope. And the rest of the life cycle of the digital bond that we are issuing is still on the legacy for many reasons, but it's, it's very proactive approach and we think it's the best way for adoption because you need one thing that is the technical connectivity and thank you for CCIP to, uh, to provide it, it was very interesting. But you need, as, as uh, Alex mentioned, it, you need the rule book interoperability and you need a standard that Swift is providing and it's very, very uh, important to, to have that, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole picture. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Yeah, on our side, it was an obvious uh, experimentation to participate to because we already doing this interoperability with our customers. None of the banks that are connected to the six digital exchange, which will be around 20 by the end of the year, uh, are able to manage a, uh, uh, a node, are able to manage uh, the, the, the private key of accessing a private, uh, uh, a private blockchain, in our case, uh, today. And we need to find ways for those entities to communicate with our setup be it on private or public chains, by the way. So what we've introduced at, at, at SDX and exactly what you've done is we allow fixed protocol for trading and we allow swift protocol for settlement of transactions as well as corporate actions to ensure that there is this seamless integration with existing system. We also have a link with our traditional exchange and CSD, which, which means that anything that is on the, uh, C the traditional world can be tokenized on blockchain, but vice versa. Anything we issue natively on blockchain can be tradable and uh, settleable in T plus two form on the traditional exchange. And why is it so important? Because as you mentioned, it's gonna take years before this technology prevails uh, in the financial sector. Uh, likely, uh, there's a debate on whether it's gonna be five, 10 or 15 years, at the end doesn't matter. In the meantime, as an FMI, we need to have our system operate. Our job is not to play with technology, is to offer services to our members that they can use, that a bond issued on blockchain is the same value of a bond issued on traditional finance, for example. And therefore, these interoperability solutions are, are critical. So what we've learned from the experience with, uh, with Swift and, and our colleagues is effectively, what are the steps towards that interoperability? What is missing? What, what are the topics we need to deep dive a bit more to make them uh, uh, solved, actually, to solve those issues, because there are still issues to uh, interoperability, a and, and we're looking forward to the next steps to this, uh, of, of this work. Yeah, and I will build on what Alex has said. The experiment of SWIFT was not a short experiment. It was a long one. And we have not just explored the technical side, but the legal and regulatory side as well. 
And from my perspective, when, when I am in those workshops and we are talking about, there are a bunch of things which Web2 do really well. And how we can apply that institutional grade thinking to the Web3 world. What I mean by that, let's look into some examples and hope it will crystallize. There is a very important concept of rate limiting. Like if you're under attack, can you rate limit the transaction so the loss can be minimized? If you look at majority of the hacks which has happened in the Web3, if you just implement rate limiting, the loss will reduce more than 99%. That's one of the controls which got discussed in the SWIFT um, pilot where we have gone collectively, what is our view on rate limiting? Once you solve for rate limiting, then there's other action which is on the legal side. When people think about moving a token, there are two predominant ways. Um, I can lock something here on this chain, and then I can mint something on the other chain. Technically sounds awesome, but what is the legal implication? The moment I lock the token on this chain, who is liable for security of that asset? Is that asset controlled by the protocol versus the operator in this case? And these are some of the harder questions which we have worked upon to then build this idea of what this institutional grade interoperability look like. The other very big advantage is with SWIFT, we're talking around 11,000 financial institutions which are connected to SWIFT. Uh, at an ANZ, we take pride in our journey and we have built a wallet infrastructure, signing, like everything is there. But out of 11,000 organization, not everyone is on the same level of maturity in digital assets. You can't expect that on day zero, every financial institution have custody infrastructure, signing infrastructure, all of that. But the beauty of the Swift pilot was people can use their existing infrastructure and play in the digital assets world. And, and that's game changing. You go from zero organization to potentially 11,000 organizations who don't have to worry about a gas token, wallet, and start transacting in the world of Web3. Like, if there's any way to get billion users to chain, this is the one of the easiest one, I will say. Great, Ma makes sense. Um, I, I think what I've seen from the uh, initial proof of concept work we've done here is that there's a lot of interest in using Swift messages to efficiently integrate into chains with, uh, with a system like CCIP that can allow that integration to be efficient and secure. But I think we should dive in deeper on that because it's not you know, something that everyone fully understands, I think. So, with capital markets uh, moving on chain, what are some of the big biggest benefits from them using existing standards like SWIFT um, to connect to their existing, uh, to, to blockchains from their existing systems? And how does uh, having an interoperabil interoperability layer like CCIP also, also fit into that? So, so the, the number one reason I would uh, list is what we just expressed. Um, not everyone is ready, uh, but everyone is equipped to talk SWIFT, uh, everyone, 11,000 institutions, which is already not bad. And that's one argument. Second argument is a cost argument. If I don't want to invest in a new infrastructure, the more I can reuse the one I have, uh, the better. The third argument is if you look at SWIFT today, uh, half of the messaging we have is already capital markets driven. So one message out of two on SWIFT is um, led by capital markets activity. If you oversimplify what we're doing on Swift, we are enabling indirect access to assets. And so what we're doing is, in essence, you have an investor that would be sitting in Japan. That investor is willing to buy or sell an asset in Germany. Doesn't have direct access to domestic markets because that would be too costly, too complex to achieve. He's going to do that through a chain of actors over Swift. Exactly in the same way of thinking, if we want to unlock secondary, secondary markets on digital assets, we should also allow indirect access to those assets. And the best way to do that is probably to reuse what we know, which are Swift messages, and allow these messages to tap directly on the chain. Another example would be, as an investment bank, what I really want to do is invest. I don't specifically want to connect to chains. So I might want to send an existing Swift message to my custodian bank, 
and that message can directly have a repercussion and uh, action on the chain through the construct that we tested in the experiment. So that's where I see the power of uh, reusing Swift messages is actually to try to unlock in a, in a short sort of window of time to unlock trading activities on digital assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's good to talk about messages, Swift messages. What I really like in, in that approach of thinking Swift plus blockchain is that today with your system, uh, Sergey, you can have a standard for the technical interoperability. Let's put it like that. But on top of it, if you don't know what you're talking about, it's like sending faxes. We all have a fax system, but you look at the fax and you don't know what's, what's about. So the SWIFT standard defining what is an instrument, what is an equity, what is a bond, what is anything, is something that is, what, 40 years old, something like that. And it has, or even more, <laughs> But it has the whole knowledge of the banks for 50 years that is combined in a single standard. And reinventing the wheel doesn't make sense because the 11,000 firms using SWIFT, you can expect there are 11,000 people understanding the standard. So if you want adoption, you need a return on investment that is quite small. The best way to have a small return is to have a small uh, a big return is to have a small investment. And if you can reuse all the process that you put in place to create a swift message and just adapt it to a, a query to a smart contract using exactly the same data definition, you will save a lot of money for the industry and you can have a massive adoption much faster than if you have to re-implement a new JSON with a lot of fields that nobody will understand because we will spend again, we, we did it before, uh, we will spend again years uh, defining what is the real meaning of a code word used in the standard, and it's true that how oh, it works. But today it's done, we have the standard. So if we want adoption in traditional uh, market, like, like where I'm from, uh, we need uh, to go for something that is easy and that the market is ready. If you come with something completely new, I don't think the market is ready for transition today. It will take 10, 15, 20 years. So that's why on top of the technical standard that you, you can provide, and I think it's a good way forward, you need this standard for defining an instrument, you need a legal framework, you need a rule book, and you have a long story to understand how to manage the reference data. That is key for um, real-time settlement, for example. Just make it short. <laughs> just adding that you just did a, mer a marvelous pitch for the keynote I'm giving tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be about I the, the reuse of existing standards in the blockchain industry. There, uh, there are quite a few that exist. There is no reason to reinvent them. You can reuse and apply them to blockchain. That's what we've done at SDX. Our entire infrastructure is based on the ISO 2022 data standard. And why? Because we needed it to be interoperable with the traditional finance, but also because it's there. So there's no reason to redefine what a trade date is or settlement date is, but it's always been defined by the industry for 100 years. Uh, it's still the same in the blockchain, sp in, uh, whether the blockchain is under or whether a traditional network is, is under the, uh, the, the, the hood. Yeah. So what, what Alex just said, if you apply that to a setting where CCIP is enabling information flow and value flow. Combine that with understanding of instrument and workflow. What do you get? You get programmatic workflows where value and information can move together, which looks like that if someone understands that the, the digital asset which is issued is a bond, how the interest can be programmatically triggered and using CCIP, you have users on hundreds of networks, and programmatically you can credit interest in each of their wallets. Using ex like existing standards to identify these programmatic workflows which are possible when you have information and value moving together. And that is the big gain, that there's a bunch of work which is done, and now there is this disruptive technology which is making things so efficient that we are not able to see at the moment. 
and taking away all the operational complexity, who in the world want to maintain gas token for 100 chains? Raise your hand. If I get one person to say yes to that, I will take you out for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Someone is interested See, for dinner. Th that's the one <laughs> which very, very less likely to happen, correct? So, and CCIP removes all those operational inefficiencies and enables programmatic workflow by building on that existing knowledge. Um, and that's where I think the real gains sit. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, I think the way you folks have been putting it is that there's a shared language and a shared standard. Um, I think that's the thing that uh, over time I understood about Swift was it, it was the technical language that banks use to define their transactions, to define their settlement, to define how, they, how they're going to work together. And recently, turning 50 years is a very big achievement for any technology or really anything technical. And I think that uh, taking that and making it useful in our industry can efficiently unlock huge amounts of usage and liquidity. Um, and that's what I've heard from you know, the hundreds of different people at banks that I've spoken to. It's, it's kind of the same pattern. Um, the Web3 industry has had a slightly strange view, I think, of we need to destroy this or kill that or this or that. I, I, I think that um, destroying things is, is not necessarily as productive an activity as finding a way for people to collaborate and make um, both of the industries grow and get better. And at the end of the day, all of the world's value is on this standard. Uh, of Swift messages, and all of it is signed with uh, Swift private keys to move between banks and treasuries and everywhere. So, you know, I'm really glad that you shared this, this view with us, and I think it's, um, it's something that uh, it's important for people to understand that Swift isn't kind of just like a for-profit payment network. It's a shared language. It's a shared um, way for people to align on how basically transactions work. And then you can take that shared standard and you can take the private keys used to sign that standard securely and you can apply them to use this additional kind of layer of uh, transactions that you find within blockchains, which are kind of the preferred now format, technical format for transactions. But as, was, as it was mentioned by the, the distinguished and experienced panelists here, a lot of that can happen off-chain, right? So you can define all of those transactions off-chain and then you can help uh, execute those on-chain through something like CCIP. And so I think it's a way to accelerate both the value that blockchains bring to the uh, capital markets and all the value in capital markets, which is trillions of dollars easily, that is already ready and waiting to flow into the blockchain, uh, public blockchain and even private blockchain world, that enabling that will be, um, you know, I think a very big uh, increase in what our industry is able to do and, and who it's able to serve, which is what, at the end of the day, I think we're all working on, whether we're in uh, the capital markets or whether we are uh, in, in Web3 public blockchain land, it's all kind of really the same set of goals and, and problems in, in certain ways. Um, the, the, the next question, I think, is more for the financial market and infrastructure folks. So for uh, Olivier and, and Alex, who have uh, more kind of to, to do with this question. What, um, whether it's primary or secondary markets, how can smart contract capabilities such as atomic settlement transform the processes for trading and settling digital assets? Uh, Olivier, please uh, tell us what, what you feel. Yeah, uh, I think I, I just listened to you and I, I realized that if you want to go from on-chain to, uh, from off-chain to on-chain, uh, you have to understand what is the pain point of a bank. You don't necessarily need what is successful on the private net on the public network and apply it to a private bank, for example, uh, because the pain points sometimes are, are different. Like we're talking about atomic settlement. Uh, that's a subject we, we know for years and years. Do we need atomic settlement in the industry? Today, we don't need it. It's not a pain point, for example. But we have other very important topics that is uh, basically, um, uh, what about the programmability of a token? How can we implement it in a smart contract that an infrastructure like us become an, op an observer and not a very active member? So you launch the, the security, for example, you pre-program a lot of things on it, and you just look and show the integrity of the issuance because you're legally forced to do it, and you let the smart contract doing it. 
that that's probably something. But I, I don't feel the market is that ready to move too quickly. So I really urge to, to look at the current pain points that are faced by the, the banks. That's my conclusion. Time is, is going well, so. M makes sense. Alex? Yeah. <coughs> well, in our, in our situation, uh, we we're a bit less conservative on, on adopting atomic settlement. So everything that settles on the SDX platform is atomically settled against tokenized Swiss franc and soon central bank digital currency by the end of the year. So the Swiss National Bank is currently connecting to infrastructure to, do, uh, to enable DVP atomically with CBDC. And we think it's the future. So we want to actually, through example, bring along our banks, our bank members, towards atomic settlement, the same way that in the payment world, instant is the new norm. Atomic will be the new norm as well in the capital market. I agree with you, it will take some time, and that's why we're looking at solutions on how we can help with pre-funding of atomic settlements through uh, flash loans or, or, or of securities or uh, solutions that actually um, the Web3 world are inspiring us with, uh, like uh, atomic, uh, AMMs and, and, and lending borrowing protocol like Aave. And we, we're trying to replicate and emulate those experiences and those new ways of doing business in the traditional market. But I agree with you, it will take time. But I think the direction is travel is clear. It will be atomic settlement. Yeah, but something very important, I think, is we both, we can do atomic settlement on our own system, but financial transaction is coming from five, six, seven intermediaries. The problem is not you, it's not us. I mean, we can do it. The yeah. problem is from the market perspective, you have to do the whole atomic settlement from the issuer to the investor. And even if we can do it on a very narrow niche, it doesn't mean that the industry is ready to move to for example, T plus one, as we discussed today. So that's a real big... Uh, Fully agree, but I do expect that the level and numbers of intermediaries will diminish over time okay. because of the technology itself. The reason why we have so many intermediaries is because the post-trade technology was not up to the level it needed to have more easy direct access to markets. And I think uh, blockchain technology can help having those uh, unnecessary intermediaries between brackets uh, removed from, from the list of intermediaries mm -hmm. and make uh, markets more easily accessible from anywhere in the world. But, of course, that will take time. Fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Just the, the final question here of the session, um, starting with, with Anurag, um, because I think he's, he's quite close to you know, what he's seeing from users and, and the clients. So what do you feel is driving banks, asset managers, and financial market infrastructures to adopt blockchains and digital assets? How do you feel that digital assets will evolve over the coming years in the capital markets? And what kind of assets will it start with? And what kind of assets will it evolve into? Um, really big question. And the, I will try to answer it with what we are seeing, how it's playing out in the market today. At ANZ, we believe the markets with highest level of friction will be the ones which will be tokenized first. Um, and these are newer markets. So when we look towards assets like carbon credit um, and other nature-based assets, what you will find is these markets are pretty much in the forming stage. And they don't have that power of incumbency which stops from adoption. Um, which is where we have ourselves started our journey of tokenization with carbon credits, where it is a perfect use case. No existing market infrastructure at scale exists at the moment. It is a newer market. So we have tokenized carbon credits and made it available on ANZ Marketplace, which people can purchase using ANZ Stablecoin. And it's, it's a real-time atomic settlement of the asset, which reduces the settlement time significantly because majority of these assets today get traded over the phone, OTC markets. Whereas by making them available on a marketplace, you solve for transparency, price discovery, and a lot of good stuff. So we believe those are the markets which will go after first, and for the obvious reasons of like efficiency, transparency, all those reasons will drive the adoption. M makes sense. Alex, since you also deal closely yep. with clients, please. Uh yeah, so we started with bonds. Why? Bonds are easy and very efficient. Uh, the reason why we started with bonds is because it's a good guinea pig, yep. in the sense that it's easy and an easy instrument to 
play with. It pays a, a coupon once a year, most of the time. So that's why most of the financial market experimentation you're seeing today are on bonds. People understand it, and it works. But I agree fully with you, is that the, 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 the first to come next, I would say, are the inefficient instruments. Uh, private markets, for example, in private shares, that's what we're currently working on. Structured products, which today are very, by definition, uh, bespoke per customers and are not really uh, standardizable. We believe that with smart contract and, and, that and blockchain technology, we can start creating uh, some, some level of standardization in, in, in the structured product world. Uh, you also have, uh, obviously, a carbon credit is a, is a good one, and funds in general, although funds is becoming quite uh, efficient and, 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 and work thanks to uh, platforms offered by Euroclear and Clearstream but, and, and others, uh, it's still, it, it, it can still be improved, especially in terms of tran uh, transfer agency service. So when you subscribe or redeem from a fund, the process afterwards is still somewhat long and could be reduced by, by blockchain technology. Great. Thank you for, for sharing your, your views on that. Um, I think we're over time at this point because it's been such a great panel with, uh, once again, people who are really at the cutting edge of bringing blockchains and smart contracts and oracles into the capital markets. I think I'm seeing um, a huge amount of general demand for all types of assets, and I'm noticing that a lot of them are basically based on what that specific bank is good at. So there is already a, a class of experience in carbon credits. So there's a, another bank or entity that's experienced in real world asset token, uh, sorry, experienced in real estate that they want to turn now into a real world asset token. Or there's banks that literally, I've talked to banks that have gold vaults. And these banks have existed for 20, 30, you know, 40 plus years. They have literal gold vaults in the basement of, of the bank, uh, which provide a much higher level of security than, than many other resources that store gold. And they're looking at making gold uh, real world assets. So I, I think each bank will kind of choose the things that it's uh, particularly good at and what its clients want. And I think our role is to create an infrastructure that allows all of those banks with all their different asset types to generate those uh, real-world assets in an easy, efficient way for them to gain access to all the different markets um, on all the other chains. So there's liquidity for those assets and someone actually purchases them. And then the other very important thing that's going to allow even more banks to join and even more banks to add liquidity uh, to the system, to the CCIP system and to the on-chain uh, finance system is, is that they can integrate using existing standards and they can uh, coordinate this activity with the with the help of uh, organizations like Euroclear and kind of understand that complexity while using their, their existing systems and standards. So I, I think this is the pattern that we're all uh, excited about. And I really appreciate everyone uh, sharing their thoughtful views on the adoption of uh, real world assets and smart contracts. Uh, I wish we could uh, stay here for another hour hearing, <laughs> hearing your views about how this will evolve. But it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. And I appreciate all the, all the thoughtful feedback. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you.